From the Tiger Cats Audio Network, this is Tiger Cats Game Day with Courtney Stephen and Mike Daly. Welcome to Tiger Cats Game Day presented by Tiffany Gate Fresh Gourmet on the Tiger Cats Audio Network. It is week 17, September 30th, and the Calgary Stampeders are heading to Tim Hortons Field to play against the Hamilton Tiger Cats, who are 6-8 and eight on the season, looking to solidify a spot in that Eastern Division playoff race. This one is important for both sides as Calgary is fighting for their playoff lives as well. Calgary sits at 4-10, and 10, and they've got their whole season on the line right now, battling it out with Saskatchewan for that race in the West. So, Mike Daly... You're, you're here to tell me exactly how this game fits into the scope of this season. What are you seeing when you look at this matchup? Yeah, I'm seeing opportunity for the Ticats here, right? Like Calgary's had a couple slides the last two games, one against Edmonton and a uh, close one against Edmonton, and then one again against Montreal, which they just really didn't show up for. But, you know, what's weird about this Calgary team is, you know, you start diving into some of the numbers and stuff, you just start wondering, like, why are they losing? How are they losing, right? Jake Mayer's playing pretty well. Like, it looks like he's, you know, when you watch the game, he's getting the ball downfield. It's just not very timely, right? But what you're also seeing is with the Ticats, it's almost the same thing, right? Minus the getting the ball downfield. There's just not really many explosive plays, but you go back to that Toronto game for the Ticats and just timely efforts from the offense or the defense it just wasn't really meshing together right the offense would be playing well but then the defense would kind of be letting it slide and then second half rolls around the defense plays really well and then the offense lets it slide a little bit so it's one of these ones where you know very important obviously for that playoff race but a, a good opportunity for the tie cats to try to keep this losing calgary team losing and, and, and out of the playoffs but also just to try to time up that you know cohesive football team between offense and defense all playing well at the same time right yeah jake jake mayer has 3581 yards leading the cfl entering this game and he's on a, a team that is led by an ex-quarterback and coach dickinson so you know that if they're going to go out, they're going to go out throwing that thing. And Calgary traditionally has been a team that likes to air it out. We know very well as we went over and recruited one of their ex-pivots in, in Bo Levi Mitchell. And not much has changed in the the ideology of that team since the days of, of Bo Levi over uh, uh, wearing red and black. So we know what to expect. There's going to be a lot of action. And especially given the way that the lineups have shaken out for this game, we can expect to see the tie cats D tested in the air with the likes of JV and Elliot not being in the lineup. He is the boundary halfback who's played every game this season. He is out and that's a, a late change to the roster in this week and coming in for him will be Will Sunderland, who is going to play the boundary corner. And then Kenneth George Jr. is going to bump inside to play the half. Then you, you also got Dexter Lawson and Richard Leonard on the other side of the field, Stavros Katzentonis rounding out that back end. So this this secondary is going to have its own challenges to get past, working on gelling, coming together, communicating, and defending the big play because that has really been where they've needed to improve. They've got some more takeaways as the season's gone on. They've they've had some key conversions on second downs and in the red zone, but there's always seemed to be that one play that's given up, that's turned the tables. That's what we saw last week against Toronto. They're going to have to keep the top on this defense this week. How do they go about doing that against a team that has a quarterback who's throwing the ball more than anybody? Well, and Cor, let me, before I answer that part of the question, I just want people to understand, and I, maybe I'll turn this on you a little bit, is how difficult is it for a guy like Kenneth George Jr., who first year in the league, right, he's used to this boundary corner spot, probably didn't get a ton of time in practice based on when that injury happened with JV and Elliott. So now you move, it's just on the depth chart, it looks like just one spot over. But to move from a corner to a halfback, especially a boundary halfback where there's so much action. Like, try to put that into words on what that, it, how hard that is going to be for Kenneth George Jr. Well, I'd say the two roles 
are very different. Um, they they complement each other in that they have to work together. And oftentimes, if one player is in the shallow part of the field, the next player meaning the halfback or the corner will be in the deep part of the field. Or if they're working with two receivers, they would be switching with each other and having chemistry there and man-to-man coverage. But the halfback, the halfback would be involved in run fits more often. They would be traveling across the formation in four by one more often. They would be cross reading in the deep part of the field, looking for routes coming back from the strong side to the weak side more often. So there's just a different vantage point and different responsibilities that's put on that boundary half. And I think that's why you got a guy like Kenneth George Jr. who's seen action live live action this season moving into that half spot because he would be able to get up to speed much quicker than will sunderland who really hasn't got the reps this year so regardless of skill set i think just the sheer reps and seeing action live kenneth george jr is going to be a better fit to move over there and be more prepared now i do think that there's a lot to hash out still you can know the playbook but mike you know if you get two receivers close to the box and and that back offset weak you better not only have chemistry with your boundary half and your boundary corner but that will linebacker as well starts to get involved and i can guarantee that calgary's offense is going to test the communication in that boundary side wouldn't you say absolutely that's the first if i was this calgary offense and this calgary coaching staff i would look at the this depth chart and go whoo here we go. Let's see. Let's see what Kenneth George Jr. can do at this boundary halfback because it's a lot of moving parts. Like you just said, it is a ton of moving parts. It it's not the same as playing that boundary corner. There are so many different things that can happen, right? Like you said, you're involved in the run more. I remember, and Corey, you'll remember this. Delvin Bro at the boundary corner. He used to be out there. He'd just say, you know what? Let me lock my guy down. I don't want to see anything. There would be a couple times where teams would force him to come over to the other side of the field, to the strong side of the field. We would be in a zone, okay? So no one's covering man-to-man. Bro would be running over and saying, I'm just covering this guy. I don't care what we're playing. I'm not playing any zone. I don't know what I'm doing over here. I'm covering this guy, (laughs) right? And that's what that boundary corner is used to doing. So now you turn into the halfback. There's a lot more going on, and you can't just do that like what Delvin Bro was doing, right? So it is quite a bit of moving parts, and I'm very, very interested to see how Calgary is going to go and attack this boundary side with a new boundary corner, Will Sunderland, and then uh, with Kenneth George Jr. having to move inside. I'm expecting Begleton to show up there constantly. Yeah, B- Begleton is going to get the Jordan treatment because uh, we were the only team that played box in one. I don't even think that's a a football yeah. defense. That's a basketball defense. Yeah. That's how they, they used to treat Jordan. One person played man-to-man, and everybody else played zone around him. And when we had Delvin Bro on the team, that was his strong suit, press man. And to simplify things and take away all the thinking, more often than not, he ended up playing man-to-man and, and preferably got up on the line, jammed somebody, and put his hands on them. So not to say that Bagleton is Jordan, but to say that he could get that box and one if they if they bring Sunderland over to the to the wide side of the field. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Mark Washington waters the playbook down just a little bit so it's easier <laughs> to grasp and play fast. But then, you know, just rounding out the rest of the defense, You've got Jamal Davis in the lineup. He's a new guy who came over from Montreal. You've got an old, an, a familiar face that's in the starting lineup, Mo Diallo, who's going to be playing defensive tackle in the place of the uh, injured Ted Laurent. And then you've got Pavi at the middle linebacker who will be getting the notional start ahead of uh, Jameer Thurman, who, of course, will then step into his regular role at that middle linebacker spot. So still navigating the intricacies of these dynamic canadian football league rosters and you know hats off to the general managers and the personnel department for understanding the nuance of nationality and rep counts and who these guys are at the end of the day though when i look at this defense and i specifically look at the front i see a lot of guys who are able to contribute and you know mo diallo being one of those as well this is a guy who a lot of people forget but he was projected to be a you know, a a second day pick guy in the NFL draft. And so when when he gets his action, I know he'll be hungry to make the most of it. And of course, um, the new Davis coming over from Montreal, a lot of a lot of the rushes are 
the same everywhere you go. You just have different names for him. So I don't see it being a very long learning curve for him to get up to speed. But, you know, Ja'Garrett Davis, Casey Sales, veteran guys playing alongside him, I'm sure they'll get him up to speed real quick. And they'll need that D-line to apply some pressure in the game tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And Mo Diallo, just a little bit more about him. Ted Laurent's out, which is, is tough, right? But what Ted Laurent is really good at is holding down his gap, right? Running, rushing upfield, not letting O-line move him at all, right? He's a very hard man to move. He's very strong, stronger than most people on that field. Mo Diallo's a little bit of a different player, right? Mo Diallo's one of these big guys who's strong in, in his own right, but he's one of these little dancing bears, right? Like he can kind of de- bounce around some of these old linemen. He can bounce in between people, you know, give a little head fake, kind of like a receiver running a route out there, but can kind of shake up a little offensive lineman. So it's going to be interesting. You're going to see a little bit more what you call games on the defensive line, which is like, you know, the twists. It's not just running straight up field because with Casey Sales, who's, you know, a little bit of a tweener between that, you know, D tackle spot and an end, um, and then now Mo Diallo in there, obviously with you know Mason Bennett and some of these guys subbing through. There's going to be a lot more action, a lot more movement up on that D-line, trying to confuse this Calgary offensive line and, and getting some good angles for the D-line to be able to get some pressure on Jake. Yes, and of course, uh, Trey Crawford is out this week as well, and, and that's what gave space for these these gentlemen to step in on that D-line. Looking for Malik Carney to show up again as well because, mm-hmm. you know, putting pressure on Jake Mayer will be a big part of defending and supporting that, that defensive backfield. Now let's let's hop over the other side of the ball. Um, Keandre Smith, <laughs> big game last week, and I know playing outside wide at, at that Z receiver, as they call it, you don't typically become the primary target, but it's great to see that he is coming into his own when the, the bell is rung and his turn is his shows up. Also got Chris Osikusi stepping into the lineup in a supporting role. So between Keandre Smith, Osikusi, and Ternowski, you've got some, some solid Canadian depth at the wide receiver position, along with Bayless, White, and Terry Godwin, who have been doing a, a good job this year so far. I, I think that Tim White, you know, we know what he can do, but I'm excited to see him play because I went out to practice this week and, you know, typically I'm not looking for anyone in particular, but Tim White just has some pep in his step. And I feel like, you know, he's starting to hit his stride in this season and I would love to see him turn on when the lights are on as we're getting close to that playoff stretch. You know, when your star players start playing their best the rest of the guys really elevate their game as well. And I think if Tim can be on tonight, that would have a huge impact. That would reverberate through the rest of the offense. I think guys would really feed off of that. Yeah, and I think a little bit of that too is how uh, how Taylor Powell's been playing, right? Like usually like if you're struggling or there's a new quarterback or timing's not right, it's easy for everybody to kind of get down on each other. But for, you know, this offense is rolling, right? Now, it wasn't timely, but Powell Lasky still put up 334, right? So he's getting the ball out there. It's it's working well when they're, they're a well-oiled machine. It just has to, like I said, be timely. But that's going to give those receivers a little bit more confidence, right? And then Tim's going to feel a little bit better to get out there and run his routes a little bit harder. It's, it's a big-time effort thing. But I am curious to see how Ternowski fits into this offense because he came back last week, right? Didn't really get a ton of time in there. Um, but I, I'm interested to see because, you know, if you look at if you look at this receiving core across the line, it's not a very big group, right? Not a very tall group. It's fast, quick, that kind of stuff, which, you know, Ticat fans are used to. But it'll be interesting to see what kind of offensive play calls Scott Milanovic goes to because of uh, it being a little bit smaller of a group. So I'm curious to see how they kind of bounce back from that Argos game. But Again, I think when you look at this game plan, it's going to be same old, same old. If you know, if you're looking to win, it's get James Butler the ball. Yeah, and uh, you know, looking at the other team, Calgary, their their offense, they've got you know Margaret Michelle, and they've got Tommy Lee Lewis. Tommy Lee Lewis is a it's like a little lightning yeah. bolt. This guy is yeah. a electric returner, very fast. He spent a lot of time in the NFL. I actually played with him in college at Northern Illinois University, so I know T. Lee very well. And uh, these these are folks that, you know, 
while the Ticats have a, a little bit of an undersized, more speed, per, all-purpose receiving core, I, I'd say that Calgary's got a lot of the same. Where Before, their, their receivers used to be super big. Eric Rogers, uh, Kamar Jordan, Jawan Breskison, the 6'4 guys, the 6'6 the six, six guys, the 6'5 guys. Now they've got a lot of speed to defend too, so it'll be interesting to to see those matchups. Even though the receivers they don't actually go head to head, but you know Tim White of the world, he can run with about anybody. So I wouldn't be surprised if if the scoreboard's lighting up a little bit in this game because both teams are probably gonna come out and, and put that ball up in the air. So now let's let's uh talk about these matchups because really that's what this is all about and especially at this point in the season I think the big players have to really show up and every it's a, it's a team game it takes 12 to win it on both sides of the ball all three phases and all that good stuff but I think there are a few key matchups and it boils down to who gets the better of whom in the clutch so if you were going to look at some key lineups in this one I have a I have something in mind just based on what we've talked about to this point, but where would be a key matchup that would have a pivotal impact on this game? Yeah, I think uh, one of them is going to be uh, Julian Hauser. So Julian Hauser was with the Thai Cats last year, right? Went over to Calgary, has definitely been in the ear the entire week of the offensive coordinator giving all the play calls, giving the looks, explaining what's going on, trying to help out that offense because he knows he knows that defense, he knows Mark Washington's defense inside and out. But it's going to be kind of looking at him versus Jordan Murray, right? And not even just Julian Hauser, Mike Rowe is on the other side for Calgary. Both of these guys get to the quarterback, right? So I'm going to be looking at, at these two fen- two defensive ends against Jordan Murray and Riley on both of the, both sides, but Realistically, got to keep Taylor Powell up. Got to give him some time in there. And Julian Hauser and, and Mike Rose are two really tough matchups, right? They're always in the backfield. So I, that's where my first matchup is going to be looking because, again, got to give Taylor Powell some time back there because I think he's really coming to do his own. Yeah, and it's I was so close to, to touching on the same thing. I think it really <laughs> is going to start up front. But between Derek Wiggin... Uh, Judge and Micah Awe, I think those three are going to be keyed in, keyed in on James Butler. And James Butler, we've seen him have amazing games. And typically when that happens, the Ticats, they, they have a chance to win when it's the last few minutes of the game. And if he is not necessarily involved, they become a little bit more one-dimensional and they have to have other guys have huge games to make up for that that loss of production and I, I just think that triangle inside between Derek Wiggin, Judge, and Awe, like that's a that's tough. Like they're not missing a lot of tackles between those guys. They're not blowing a lot of gap assignments between those guys. Those are veteran players. They are disruptive. And specifically in the run game, like they make it really tough. So I'm interested to see how James Butler can get going. Maybe it's running a little bit more off tackle. Not like it's gonna be a walk in the park going up against Mike Rose either. But um, do they go off tackle? Do they run counter misdirection? Is there a little bit more of like the swing passes in the screens? I I know that they're going to try and get James Butler involved, but I want to see how they do it. And how do they neutralize those linebackers who are, you know, among the best in the league and, and racking up tackles at a faster clip than just about anybody? Yeah, absolutely. And one more thing I do want to look at, which I think is, you know, we talked about it already. But I do want to, this is a game for Kenneth George Jr. to come out and and not win the game by himself, but make a huge impact. Because, like I said, they're going to put people up against him. They're going to put Trey Odom's Duke. They're going to try him a couple times at that half. So if we're looking at a matchup, if you're not sure where to look right before the ball is snapped, take a peek over on that weak side of the field and and see how that goes because there's going to be a lot of action. But I do think that area is really going to determine how this game goes with Will and and, uh, Kenneth George Jr. over there. Man, Kenneth George Jr., he might get that halfback blitz and get the first sack of his (laughs) career. That's what I'm saying. I feel like that would be an absolute game changer as well because – Never underestimate a guy's opportunity to step up when the lights shine bright because 
I've I've been around guys, and to a degree, I felt like at points in my career, it wasn't even necessarily about the week of prep and the backpedaling and the drills and all that stuff. Like that's all well and good. Some guys play better under pressure. And I think when you're in a new situation, when there is a lot of attention on you, that can either help you rise to the occasion or it can be considered a stressor and it can be considered something to to make it a pressure situation. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Ken George Jr. just rose to the occasion and had his best game of the year, given the circumstances. So I'm, I'm excited to see how he responds. You know, uh, everyone will be watching. So I know Stavros will tell him, hey, man, I got your back. Go up there and play aggressive. And if they've got that kind of chemistry, I wouldn't be afraid, uh, surprised to see him hang it loose. Now, one thing I do want to talk about, you know, when we, we get to the X factors, I probably want to throw mine out there first and just see, get your take on it. I actually think that between Tommy Lee Lewis and Tyreek McAllister, that somebody is going to score a return touchdown in this game. I've Have you been watching both of these guys all year long? I mean, they're about as electric as it can get. What what are you thinking if you're going into this game as as special teams coordinator Jeff Reinbold or Mark Killam for for Calgary? Are you thinking I got to get my guy into the end zone or are you thinking I got to stop this other guy <laughs> from getting into the end zone? Which one is more important? Ooh, that's a great question. Which one's more important? I think the more important one is definitely stopping them getting the end of the end zone because there you always talk about getting, you know, decent returns to get good field position. So not necessarily always talk about getting the guy in the end zone, but if you give up a kick return or a punt return touchdown, it's backbreaking. It is absolutely backbreaking. Any momentum you had, throw it out the window, right? Anything that you felt like you were come anything, it's it's gone. It's completely backbreaking. Or, you know, the offense doesn't even get or the defense doesn't even get to go out there and give it a shot, right? And it's just right back to it. So I think you're absolutely right. I love that. I love that X factor because Tommy Lee Lewis is electrifying, right? He is a little jitterbug in there, hard to bring down. He'll hide behind some of his blockers. But we talked about this a little bit earlier when Tyreek McAllister took kind of that backseat in uh, the support role, right? Coming in as a backup, you know, getting a little bit of reps, but not all of them on offense. What that does is gives you a little bit more energy, right? Keeps that, that fatigue from setting in. So, He's leading the league right now in kickoff return average. Got to see it a little bit more in the punt return. But with not as many reps on offense, he's now going out there in every single kicking situation where he's returning. And he's going to have a little more juice behind him, right? A little more juice to break one more tackle. A little more juice to give a little more, one more head fake, right? To try to get outside and use his speed. So it is going to be kind of a different look for this Ticat special teams because yeah, he's going to have a little bit more energy with, you know, a Turnowski stepping in and, and going some of that two-back stuff with Felix coming in or maybe a Sean Thomas Erlington. Um, it, it's going to be exciting to watch because you're absolutely right. Don't let their, that guy in the end zone and see if you can get your own guy in. It's going to – it'll be fun. So we, we talk special teams, offense, defense. Is there any stone unturned, Mike? What are you what are you looking for in this game that we haven't already covered? Is it someone up front? Is it the quarterbacks? Is it is it in the pass game, the run game? What's one last thing that you want people to to take note of or pay attention to in the game? Yeah, I really think that with this Ty Cats team, what it needs to be is it can't be one side of the ball rolling, right? I mentioned this at the beginning of, of our conversation, but when you see the defense start getting two and outs, right? Calgary's offense comes out there. The defense stops them two plays, and makes them punt. Then the Ty Cats offense can't go out there and do the same thing, right? Or can't go four and out and have to punt it back, right? You got to see them start working again th- together. You always hear this term complementary football, right? All that means is every side of the ball playing well at one time, right? Like that's as simple as that means. That's exactly it, right? The defense gets a stop. Offense goes, gets a couple first downs, whether it's kick a field goal or get into the end zone. But all that is is it's just turning field position and it's getting you some points. So I think when you look at this game, you want to time up because there is going to be stalled drives, right? The defense is going to give up yards at time, especially against this Calgary offense, who's pretty good. But you want to see it start working together. Start working together so that you can really turn the tide of this game kind of in like two or three drives as opposed to 
you know, really fighting against, you know, a brick wall of, you know, defense not doing well, but the offense is, and then vice versa. So I think that's really what I'm going to look for is a, you know, a nice stop for the defense. And then offense takes up all, drives it down, right? Really kills the momentum and, and gets Calgary kind of thinking, thinking twice about being able to win this game. Yeah, and if the Ticats play a clean game, which I know they can, I don't think they have to do anything crazy. They got enough talent. They got enough players in the right spots to bring this one home. And tonight, that's what we're hoping to see. It's kicking off at Tim Hortons Field. Calgary is coming to town for a 7 p.m. start. It is the day of National Day for Truth and Reconciliation at Tim Hortons Field, and the Ticats are looking to clinch a spot in the playoffs. Take a step closer, at least. So... Thanks for tuning in to Tiger Cats Game Day on presented by Tiffany Gate Fresh Gourmet on the Tiger Cats Audio Network. If you enjoyed your time with us today, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player and check out our videos on the Hamilton Tiger Cats YouTube channel. If you can't make it to Tim Hortons Field tonight, then make sure to listen in at listen.tiecats.ca where Luke and RJ as always have the call and Bubba O'Neill and Andy Fantuz got you on the pre and the post and if you tune in, actually, I'll be on the post game too. Let's so go. <laughs> come on, guys. Just tune in. Listen to TyCats.ca where you can get your TyCats fix every week. So thanks again. And until next week, hope you have a great game day. It's game day and you're ready. So are we. Let us know your thoughts. Email us at game day at tiecats.ca. Courtney Stephen and Mike Daly are here every game day with their insights into today's game. Subscribe to the Tiecats Audio Network on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.